So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the Faculty of Science uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, today's lecture is entitled Chaos, Chance, and the Randomness from Butterflies to Quantum Kinetics. So my name is Sean Zhang. I'm an Associate Dean of Science in China and the Global. So the butterfly effect, which is about whether the flap of uh, a butterfly's wings in Bra Brazil could set off a tornado in Texas, is a popular illustration of extreme instability in chaotic systems, such as our atmosphere. So in this lecture, uh, Professor Jens Markloff uh, will explain that perhaps unexpectedly, the butterfly effect can also be used as a mathematical tool to understand the relationships between physical laws on vastly different length scales. Professor Markloff will focus on some exciting recent developments uh, in kinetic theory of gases that can be traced back to the groundbreaking ideas of Maxwell and Boltzmann over a century ago. So this is a non-technical lecture that he hopes will be entertaining to anyone with a science background. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Jens Markloff today. Uh, Jens is a professor of mathematical physics and the Dean of the Faculty of Science at the University of Bristol. He graduated from Hamburg and the University of Wurm and held a considerable number of research fellowships, such as at the Princeton University, uh, Hewlett Packard, the Isaac Newton Institute in Cambridge. He joined the University of Bristol in 1999 and served as head of pure mathematics, school director for postgraduate research and head of the School of Mathematics. Jan's areas of expertise include the dynamical systems and the ergodic uh, theory, quantum chaos and the theory of uh, automorphic forms. So Jens received a major, many major awards, uh, including an EPSRC Advanced Research Fellowship in 2001, uh, Philip Leverhulme Prize in 2004, Marie Curie Excellence Award 2004, uh, Royal Society Wolfson Research Merit Award 2009, LMS Whitehead Prize 2010, and the Leverhulme Trust Research Fellowship the same year, and the uh, ERC advanced the grant 2012. In 2015, uh, Jens was elected a fellow of the Royal Society, which is the UK's uh, uh, National Academy of Sciences. So without further ado, I will now pass the floor to Professor Markloff. Uh, Professor Markloff, now it's all yours. Yeah, please. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, uh, Shuang. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here with you, even though it is virtual. Um, my last trip before this dreadful pandemic started was to Hong Kong, and I would very much like to come back. Uh, I would very much prefer to be there with you in person, but it won't be possible today, but hopefully it will be possible in the future. Um, so this talk, as Sri Aung said, is a non-technical talk, and I hope there are not just mathematicians and physicists in the audience, but also maybe some people a bit further afield so that I can explain some of the fundamental ideas here. I will really try to focus on the concepts, um, ideas, um, and uh, try to make it entertaining. So I hope I'll, I'll, I'll achieve this. If you have any questions, just stop me and I'll, I'll be happy to answer them as I, as I go along. So the, this talk will be about um, chaotic dynamics um, and the butterfly effect as one of the popular formulations of sensitive dependence uh, on initial conditions of such chaotic systems. But um, what I'll try to illustrate is how you can use the mechanism of uh, the sensitive dependence to actually understand um, how we can explain macroscopic uh, effects such as um, uh, the, the fundamental laws of fluid dynamics, starting from the underlying classical fundamental laws such as Newton laws or of course um, uh, quantum laws. It's still one of the major challenges in our understanding of how different theories are related to each other that span the different length scales. So let me start with the butterfly effect. And 
Of course, what we all do if we don't know something, we Google, right? And if you put butterfly effect into Google, you see a lot of butterflies. And um, actually, most of the things you see here uh, that come out are not actually related to the actual butterfly effect. Um, but the word is so popular that that it has spread. It has, you know, you have some movies and so on. Probably the closest that we see here is um, this picture. Um, and as you've heard in the introduction, the butterfly effect uh, links the flap of a butterfly in Brazil to the uh, occurrence of a tornado in Texas. Um, and that is, of course, a provocation, right? Um, that's why it's become so popular because, uh, you know, you say, well, well, how can this be? A, you know, how can you make any causal connection between the flap of a wing of a butterfly in Brazil and the, and the, and the tornado in, in Texas? That's, the, this provocation came from Edward Lawrence, um, a famous Phys physicist, meteorologist, and mathematicians. Some call him the, the father of sort of chaos theory, um, partly because he popularized the, the, this kind of idea of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. But as you see here in, in this presentation that he, that he gave um, uh, in, uh, uh, in 1972, um, he actually already discusses in it not just this paradox or this sort of incredible fact that why should this really happen, but actually connects it with uh, statistical information. Because, of course, um, there is no causal connection between the flap of a butterfly because it's disturbed by so many other events. The butterfly is not just a single system, it's embedded. In, in, in our entire atmosphere. And there are many, many other butterflies and many, many other um, uh, things that happen in between. So what I wanna do in this lecture ex is explain this uh, kind of connection between sensitive dependence on initial conditions on one hand and statistical properties of chaotic systems, and then how we can use them to actually derive um, uh, laws on macroscopic scales from the underlying microscopic fundamental principles. So that's the plan, and I hope you'll, you'll enjoy that. So first of all, um, let's just think about for a minute how randomness actually enters our world. There are many phenomena that we would describe uh, as random, for instance, you know, when you have uh, the lottery draw, you know, there's a machine that draws balls out of a lottery and, and we, we really hope that it's random, that it's not deterministic and someone could fix all the initial conditions of your lottery machine and predict the numbers, right? But if you believe uh, the Marquis de Laplace, who said, well, we live in a deterministic world and so if you know all the initial conditions of all the atoms and molecules and uh, etc in in the world then you can predict everything now i just as a side remark of course this was an idea far before quantum mechanics quantum mechanics of course of course has an has an intrinsic uh, uh, notion of randomness built in but let's forget that for for the time being i want to explain to you why we live essentially in a random world and why it is not uh, uh, always uh, a bad thing to be in chaos, have chaos around you. And I'll explain to you how this chaos effect will actually be a very useful mathematical tool. Right, so how can I explain um, the the fact that even though we live in a deterministic world, um, uh, many things around us seem random and chaotic. And to explain this to you, I'm going to focus on possibly the simplest model of hyperbolic or chaotic dynamics in, in mathematics, um, and that is the so-called doubling map. So we look at uh, a map, or if you like, a machine, um, where you put in a number, 
between zero and one. And this machine will do the following. It will multiply your number X that you put in by two, okay? And then it will take the fractional part of that number. Um, so there are two operations, multiplication by two and then taking the fractional part. So if you, for instance, put in 0.43, you double it, 0.86, you take the fractional part, nothing changes because the number is already between zero and one. Um, another example is you start with 0.71, you double it, 1.42, take fractional part, which just means you remove all the digits before the, the, the point and you get 0.42. So this is very, very simple. Um, but as I said, it's the first and simplest example if you give an ergodic theory lecture of a hyperbolic dynamical system. So let's explore this a little further. The point now is that you don't just do this once, but you repeat that process. So you again, you take then the number you had after the first uh, uh, operation, you multiply it again by two, take fractional part, multiply again by two, take fractional part and so on. The answer that you get if you do this n times is the same as if you'd started with your number x multiplied by two to the power n um, and then take the fractional part. So here you see, that if you do this n times, you actually multiply x by a really large number. So for instance, if you've done it 10 times, you multiply it by two to the 10 and you take your fractional part. And of course, uh, this is exponential in n. And therefore, if you change your initial condition ever so slightly, the error will grow exponential in time, right? So I've just plotted here a very simple a uh, set of examples. If you start with 0.30 or 0.31, the outcome after 10 iterations will be completely different. And, you know, if you now think back into the real world, think of this as a, as a model for the atmosphere or the, a model for any sort of system that depends on your initial condition. Um, what it really means is if you prepare your system as good as you can, you'll always have a little error, right? I mean, we are not in quantum mechanics where you have the uncertainty principle, but practically you can never prepare anything uh, 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 to such an accuracy uh, that you know precisely in which state your system is. So if there is sensitive dependence on initial conditions, um, and if, you, if it's on this exponential if it has this exponential uh, instability, then already in finite time, your error will increase so fast that um, uh, uh, the initial tiniest change will lead to um, a significant deviation. And so how can we model this now? Well, and this is where now the randomness comes in. So let's just assume that We've prepared our initial system, but we're not quite sure where it is. We make a tiny error and we model that tiny error by saying uh, the error is random. It's tiny, but it's random. And now we want to understand what the tiniest random error um, will have as an effect after a number of iterations, a number of uh, time steps of our dynamics will that tiny error become a macroscopic error so that the whole system will really look random after those finitely many time steps that's sort of the the idea and that's the explanation if you like that although we think we live in a deterministic world because of this if you like uh, amplification through the unstable dynamics of a tiny random initial error will lead to a macroscopic randomness. So let me talk you through this in a little more detail here for our model system. So you remember our system produces a number between zero and one. Um, now let's just see um, if after n iterations, this output yn is that we have here is between zero and one half or if it's between one half and one. If it's between zero and one half, we say we have tails. And if it's between one half and one, we say 
we have, sorry, if it, if it's between um, zero and one half, yeah, we say it's tails and we say it's heads if it's between one half and one. So that's what we have here. So in other words, depending on the output, you have either a one or a zero as a result. Now, for those who are a little bit more familiar with, with, with mathematics or, and of course in computer science, you will recognize actually that if you start with a number x in the beginning, then the heads or tails that you get uh, in the sequence of y ends that you produce correspond exactly to the binary expansion of the number x. So if you use the binary expansion of x, it'll look like uh, 0.0111001 and so on. And the zeros and ones correspond exactly to the tails and heads um, that are produced by this dynamical system. And um, you can, you know, for the fun, you can look at the decimal decimal expansion of a number, and that will be related, related to the dynamical system where you, rather than multiplying by two, you multiply by 10. And that's a little exercise that I can give you as a homework if you want, and see how things look like uh, in this way. But let me move away again from, from this sort of uh, technical explanation. The ta the take home message here is if we um, uh, look now at the sequences of heads and tails that we get for a given initial condition x, then if we start with an x naught, which is the initial condition we would like to prepare our system in, but we make a tiny error of this form, two to the minus m, where m is some large integer that you fix, times x, times psi, and psi is a random variable, which just means it's a random thing, right? It's our random error, but it's tiny. If you then run your machine n times, and n is bigger than your m that describes your error, you will see that you will produce a, a fair coin toss up to a tiny error. And that error is exponentially decreasing in time. So this is what this theorem says. It's, it's a mathematical observation that actually uh, is, is not trivial. So what I'm telling you, you need, to, you need to really work a little hard. And again, this is something you learn in your dynamical systems and ergodic theory lectures. Um, but the take home message is really that after only a few iterations, I mean, the smaller the error you, you, you make in the beginning, the longer you have to wait, but the exponential sensitivity is related to an exponentially fast convergence to the actual fair coin toss. Okay, so what I've presented you here is a machine that even though it's a deterministic machine can produce a fair coin toss if you're unable to to prepare your system perfectly, right? So as long as you make a, as soon as you make a tiniest error, you get a perfect coin toss. So this is, if you like, a, a very good random number generator as a physical machine. So if you don't like mathematics, okay, and I don't blame you <laughs> if you don't, let me show you another way of producing a extremely chaotic system that would produce a fair coin toss. And that's when you bake, okay? So you take your dough, take a piece of dough, um, and just to see, uh, uh, to represent our initial X. So we put four raisins into it. Each raisin, since say the first one is sort of our initial data X, and you say the difference maybe between raisin one and raisin two, is, is the error. So we you know, put, put, put those raisins in there and see what we do. So now what we do is we press down the dough as you what you do when you bake, right? Um, of course, a bit <laughs> idealized. We press it down until it has, it has half the height and it's spread uh, out by twice its width. Yeah, so you press down, it, sp it spreads out. And the spreading out 
is exactly the same phenomenon that we've seen before, multiplication by two. So now a good baker puts it back up and, and repeats this process, right? So you, you move it back up and you press down again and so on and so on. So this is also a system that mathematically you can prove has sensitive dependence on initial conditions and satisfies exactly the same kind of um, mixing and chaotic properties that, um, that you have uh, in, in this mathematical model that I showed you be before. So in conclusion, what I've tried to convince you here is that um, when you have a chaotic system, and I've showed you two models, but of course we are more interested in more complicated system in real life, but these models capture what I want to show you, is that a tiny amount of uncertainty in the initial data produces almost perfect randomness after finite time. And that is because we have the butterfly effect, because we have the exponential sensitivity on initial conditions. If you don't have that, then you will not see the perfect randomness, at least not in finite time, you will have to wait for a very, very long time. Yeah, so if you have a system where everyone moves in the same direction all the time, um, then even small disturbances will only have a very mild effect on the time evolution. And so an initial change, a random change will not lead to this kind of perfect randomness. But if you have a system that is like the butterfly effect, you will see that things mix up and spread out and become random uh, 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 very, very quickly. So I call this an exponential amplification of the initial randomness, if you like. Tiny randomness in the be beginning that you don't even see with your naked eye will become macroscopic very quickly. Um, so in mathematical terms, these kind of characterizations are in terms of exponential decay of correlations or an exponential rate of mixing. These are the kind of uh, things that mathematicians use to work out how chaotic a, a dynamical system is. Okay, but now, how can we use it, as I said, to understand the world around us and to understand really how um, macroscopic uh, uh, observations um, can be explained to the, you know, microscopic um, fundamental laws. And of course, all of our science is based on re reduction, um, reductionism. So you always believe that everything has to fit together. We believe that uh, when we run those very big experiments in the Large Hadron Collider in CERN, and we understand how uh, uh, our, uh, you know, quantum particles hit each other and produce new quantum particles, that that's the fundamental theory that is consistent with, you know, what happens when I uh, use a chair or um, switch on the electric light. Everything we believe has to be consistent. But actually, you might be surprised to learn that we even don't understand how to derive the equations of fluid me mechanics, the Navier-Stokes equations, from Newton's law. We don't know how to do this, even today, okay? And that is, I think, a gap that we need to fill. Um, or even better, how can we derive the fluid dynamics equation from quantum mechanics, or even from quantum field theory? We don't know how to do this, yeah? And so this is really what, I try to now illustrate to you how we can use now the butterfly effect and what I've explained just now to attempt to understand uh, the uh, 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 kind of transport equations that describe clouds, water waves, and so on um, from, the, from, from the microscopic laws. And this, of course, goes back to the ideas of Maxwell and Boltzmann. I have here Boltzmann's picture uh, who uh, already in the uh, 19th century had the idea to use uh, atoms and molecules uh, and their dynamics to explain the laws of thermodynamics. 
And actually at the time that was very highly controversial because people thought indeed, or many thought that, you know, water waves and so on, they are just continua, they're fluids. They are not made out of small particles. And actually he had a pretty hard time. He was ridiculed by, by some of his contemporaries, uh, in particular, uh, Mach, who was the, the famous Mach and the sort of speed of sound, uh, uh, he, he was very much against this. And so Boltzmann had a hard time uh, there justifying this, uh, his, his ideas, but he had, all, he had all the right ideas um, on how you move from gas dynamics to sort of macroscopic transport laws. And the key idea really is, as I said, sensitive dependence on initial conditions, the butterfly effect. And what you see here is um, two molecules in the famous Boltzmann gas. So Boltzmann, of course, didn't know anything about quantum theory. So he imagined the molecules are just round spheres that collide and when they collide, they collide elastically, which means they just bounce off each other. Energy is preserved. And the law of reflection is just that the angle of incidence is the same as the outgoing angle. So here I've drawn a collision um, for two initial conditions. So I'm describing my molecule, which is just a, a round sphere as um, by where its center is. So we have two here, one has a center there and one has a center there. And if I now follow the point along this initial condition, you see it would, the molecule would now be here, would collide with the other one and would then be reflected in this way. If you change slightly your initial data and you follow this red trajectory, what you observe is that the initial angle that we have here doubles after the collision. Do you see this? This is like the most important observation in all of this. So this means we have a doubling of the angle and it's exactly like the doubling map I showed you before. So this doubling after each collision, so if you have n collision, your, your angle will have changed to the two to the end. So you have exponential sensitivity here uh, 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 produced by those collisions. And now you say, okay, I start now with my Boltzmann guess, which means I have uh, 10 to the 23 round spheres, maybe in some container. And I'll try to mathematically prove that when these uh, 10 to the uh, 23 uh, uh, hard, uh, spheres move around and you zoom out in the right way, um, that that will con converge to uh, the so-called Boltzmann equation that describes a macroscopic density. Um, and that was Boltzmann's idea. And then we would do the next step and we'll say, now we start with the Boltzmann equation and then derive the Navier-Stokes equation. So this is the dream program uh, uh, that we haven't been able to complete uh, yet, even though many, many, many very famous physicists and mathematicians have worked on it. So that's the challenge. There have been some recent nice progress here for those who are a little closer to the area by a French Italian team who I've uh, cited down the bottom of the slide. So that's really the idea, but it's too complicated, at least for me. So I've been working on a different model that was uh, developed by uh, another very famous physicist, Henrik Lawrence, um, who was one of the first uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners in the history of, of, of that um, famous award. He didn't get it for this, but he, he uh, but this, this is a very famous uh, model as well. So Lawrence tried to model electron transport in metals. Uh, metals are, are crystals. Um, uh, and uh, so what he said is basically, I model my matter with fixed spheres, just as Boltzmann had his spheres that were all moving around, but I just fixed them. And then I look at my electrons moving through the uh, through the um, through this array of fixed spheres, and I think of the electrons as point particles. Now, again, this was pre quantum mechanics, but nevertheless, I just want to explain to you here the the basic principles. 
And so here you see again, two initial conditions, a black and a red. And as they move through those, uh, uh, through this array of obstacles, um, you again, by the same effect in the Boltzmann gas, have sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And if you are in a metal, it's actually a crystal. So you have a periodic array of, uh, of those obstacles. And um, we want to understand now when we have an electron gas in there, um, how does it move through this crystal? And you know, I have to again apologize to the uh, physicists because, of course, we know how all of this works in solid state theory, and we have our beautiful quantum mechanical models. Um, but I'll come come back to that at, at at the end of the lecture. For for now, we really just want to think about Newton's laws of motions of uh, a gas of point particles that move through this through this crystal. And we want to understand if we can find out um, as we zoom out and take certain limits, whether we converge to those classic transport equations that physicists like Lorentz um, have, have proposed heuristically. And again, the, the beautiful observation here is that using the, the, the exponential sensitivity on initial conditions, you can prove that when you start with a cloud of particles, this will converge to Brownian motion. So the, the most random dynamics that you can imagine is produced just by some initial randomness um, of your particle cloud that moves through this crystal. Um, and uh, I have here a picture of Yakov Sinai, the winner of the Abel Prize. The Abel Prize, if you like, is a, is, um, a, a version of the Nobel Prize for mathematicians. You might be aware that mathematicians never got the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, some people say it had to do with affairs that a mathematician had with Nobel's wife, but that's, I don't think, uh, historically completely proven. The Nobel Prize was always something that had to have a connection with the, you know, with something that you can measure experimentally. Um, so even theoretical physicists, I think some of them had to wait very long until what they've predicted was actually measured. And uh, mathematicians don't fall in that category, at least, you know, 100 years ago, uh, that was the case. So what I want to explain now is exactly um, how we can now use the exponential sensitivity to establish rigorously the ideas of Boltzmann and Lorentz. And in order to do that, I'll have to get a little technical, um, but I won't go through the sort of the formulas. I leave them for the mathematicians and physicists up there, but Anyone who doesn't like formulas can just listen to my words and um, hopefully get the get the key the key idea. So I have here two pictures um, of uh, matter. On the left, it's a disordered matter. It's it's um, a, a something that uh, could model um, uh, a, a sort of disordered system. And you think of all those blue dots as being fixed. And on the right-hand side, we have a crystal. And we would like to understand um, what happens if I have my little electron moving around uh, in either of those two um, scenarios and try to understand whether we see any difference in the dynamics of this particle as I zoom out. So this is the so-called Boltzmann-Grad limit that already Boltzmann understood. Grad was a, uh, an Austrian physicist who so sort of formalized this. And the key idea here is that you go into a low density limit in order to see macroscopic phenomena. Low density limit means simply that you shrink your uh, spheres, your, your scatterers. So that that just makes it low density and here is 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 just simply what i mean so i just fix everything and i shrink it now if you continue doing this um uh 
then eventually you will just see a particle just goes along straight lines. And that's very, very boring, right? You just make your matter more and more dilute. So uh, the mean free path, which is the path lengths between collisions will just go to infinity. And I've showed you here, there is a formula for the mean free path lengths in terms of the radius. The radius is one quarter. Um, the mean free path is two. And as we shrink that, it goes to three, four. And so we have to adjust our units to make them macroscopic so that we actually still see collisions in this limit. And this is simply done by zooming out and looking at longer and longer times. Um, so you normalize your time by the mean collision time and you use, you renormalize your space units by um, uh, uh, the mean free path lengths. And this is all that's done here on this slide. So uh, anyone who likes sort of these kind of formulas, I, uh, you know, have a look at them. And, and so really the idea is you zoom out and I have a little illustration here. So we start again with the, the original configuration of our meta left disordered right uh, periodic. And now uh, as we shrink our scatterers, we zoom out at the same time. So we rescale our length unit. So you see the whole thing becomes denser and denser. And maybe you can imagine that now, as you look at a particle moving through here, the mean free path is constant. So you start seeing a, a motion that will look more, more and more random in both cases. And really what we want to prove now is that there is something in the limit that is interesting. Um, and indeed, what you can show, uh, and that already was in Boltzmann's paper, that you get a very beautiful transport equation, the so-called linear Boltzmann equation uh, in this limit. Now, uh, Lawrence only did this heuristically, but on the next slide, I show you that actually you can establish this equation um, with very beautiful mathematically rigorous techniques that again use at its heart the butterfly effect. The fact that when you bounce off a spherical scatterer um, you, and you make a little tiny initial error, the error doubles after each collision. Now this equation is extremely important. It uh, describes neutron transport, radiative transfer, and even I have found a paper where um, uh, you model sea ice scattering. So you have little ice planks in the, in the sea um, and when there are very few of them. So the important thing here is that you scatter in matter that's very, very dilute, right? That's when you see um, this linear Boltzmann equation appear. Now, mathematically, um, you need a very important assumptions to derive this linear Boltzmann equation, namely that we are in the disordered uh, setting. So you need to really assume that your scatterers are placed randomly in space. So your matter, your matter has to be disordered. Um, and one of the really beautiful observations that emerged when you look at a crystal like scatterer configuration, like the one that I've showed you where everything is beautifully periodic. And um, you actually don't see the linear Boltzmann equation as a limit. You can show that the linear Boltzmann equation fails. And indeed you see a new process emerge um, that is still random, that is still uh, 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 easy to describe, but, but it's not what you have seen in the physics literature in these limits. Um, and both physicists and mathematicians have been interested in this setting for, for a century. And I, I think always one of the most exciting things is that you don't just show that the, the equations that physicists had um, proposed a uh, hundred years ago work and that they are consistent um, with a microscopic dynamics, but that you actually see new equations emerge and that's exactly what happened here in this um, in the in the periodic setting. Um, so 
just to explain to you one consequence um, of the difference between a, a disordered material in this boltzmann grad limit and the, the periodic material is that if you start with your cloud, yeah. Say again. Sorry, do you have any questions? I think, uh, yeah, uh, Professor Markle, just to continue, yeah. Okay, thank you. Do ask me a question if you want. So what you see here is that when you look at the limits of those equations and you now look at the long time dynamics of these limiting process processes, uh, in the first case, um, when you have a, um, when you have the linear Boltzmann equation coming uh, from the from uh, valid for the disordered setting, is you see a central limit theorem. As you know, when you have Brownian motion, uh, you can describe this by a, a, a Gaussian distribution, and this Brownian process typically describes diffusion, which happens on a time scale of square root of the time. So you look at your initial point and you see where your system is f after time t, you normalize it by square root t and you get uh, a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution for this motion. So one can establish it for this system. And the exciting thing is that when you look at the periodic setting, that I've explained to you before, um, you now see super diffusion, which means you look at the difference between initial condition and final uh, uh, position of your particle, you need to normalize by square root t log t. So this means the periodic and the disordered are not actually not so far apart. They still produce a beautiful random process in the limit, but the normalization of time is different and the reason why this is is that the free path length distribution in the disordered setting is an exponential distribution that's what you expect um, and there's no surprise but in the periodic setting you have a much higher probability of very long flight path um, and the reason for this is that in a crystal uh, you have these corridors in which you can fly and though particles eventually will hit one of the scatterers, they have a much uh, higher chance of long flights than when you have a random medium. And that's really behind this. So you have a heavy tail distribution and the variance um, is infinity. So you get a super diffusive process. And here's just a picture of such a Brownian motion in three dimensional space. And so this is really, has established of what I started off with. We've started with Newton's law, point particles moving in those uh, in, in those arrays of scatterers. And what we've showed here is that we have derived a macroscopic law zooming out that describes perfectly um, a, a perfect Brownian motion. So perfect randomness in that limit. And now, just to give a little insight in the kind of techniques that are used here, um, the first question you ask is indeed, when you start with your particle, how long does it take until you hit the first scatterer, right? And this is uh, a question about um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, free path lengths and the distribution of free path lengths. That's a question that was already asked uh, in, the earliest, in the early 20th century by uh, George Polya. Uh, a, a Hungarian mathematician, and he called it visibility in a forest. And I thought I've liked that idea um, of just standing in a forest, but of course, most forests look random. And I was very happy to see when I traveled through Italy, uh, a perfectly periodic forest. So I didn't jump out of the train, but I did, I did, um, I did go back to this forest to take this picture. Um, this is of course a, a, a plantation for paper production. And, and that's why it's a point, but it's it's very, very precise, very impressive. So the question now is if you don't like talking about electrons and matter, 
You can also just ask yourself, while well, I stand in this forest and I look in a certain direction, how far uh, uh, until I see a tree in that particular direction? And you can work out the, uh, the, the distribution of the free path lengths, um, whether it's a random forest or a periodic forest. In the random forest, you will get this as the answer. And in the periodic forest, the free path lengths distribution in this, in this limit of very small tree trunks, rescaled in the right way, that's exactly the same limit that we discussed before, where we shrink our scatterers, to zero, you can work out the free path length distribution. And it's here. And it's a new distribution, first observed by, by physicist Dahlquist, and then later rigorously established by mathematicians. And um, I just want to explain to you very quickly how this works. Uh, in fact, this is our proof um, uh, that allowed us to, to extend the theory to higher dimensions, to much more complicated scatterer configurations, not just periodic ones. And that was really the new input to have this kind of geometric interpretation. So here's the problem. We, we stand at this tree trunk and we want to see when we hit the first one. So it would be here. You can rephrase this question, just say, well, I have my line of sight here um, and I don't want that any uh, circle intersects this, this um, this line. And I want to understand this in every possible direction. So, um, you know, this is just an example, but I'd like to really understand what is the set of initial directions for which I, this red line here doesn't intersect any of my uh, circles. And now the key, key point here is I want to make, you can rephrase this question by saying, I don't want that any lattice point, so neither no longer circles, but just points, lies inside this rectangle, right? So there is a duality here, an implication in both ways, an equivalence. I'm cheating a little bit because really I should have spherical caps here. Um, then it's absolutely equivalent, the fact that I have no disk intersecting uh, my ray is equivalent to no point being inside this rectangle. Um, I'm in D dimensions here, but just ignore that. So uh, it, you really think about it in two dimensions. In high, higher dimensions, these would be cylinders. So that's equivalent. And now here comes the big trick, the big observation that is, it will look trivial to you, but that actually is the starting point of all our theory is let's just rotate this picture. So we're shooting in a certain direction, but let's position ourselves in the frame of the particle that we're moving. And let's just rotate everything to the horizontal axis. So what's happened, of course, from the viewpoint of the particle that's flying and trying to hit uh, a scatterer, um, we are now moving in a horizontal direction, but our lattice has been rotated. Now, because we, go into the slow density limit, we fly for a very long time. And so this will be a very long cylinder and it'll be very thin because our scatterers are very, very small and hence this rectangle is very small. So what we do is we apply a linear transformation to this picture to push everything into a nice proportion. Yeah, and so now the problem has turned from a long ray intersecting very, very tiny circles into a problem of lattice points intersecting a well-proportioned rectangle. That rectangle no longer depends on the radius that I'm looking at. And now we ask um, uh, how many lattice points of this now deformed lattice fall into this rectangle. That's the new problem. And what's happened here really is that we've introduced a dynamics on the space of the lattices, right? I've started off with my beautiful periodic lattice, but I've squashed it and I moved it. And actually the lattice starts moving around. And now I no longer think of the, my original dynamics of a ray in this crystal, but I think now of a renormalization dynamics on the space of lattices. Now that's the big abstract step. And we can use now the agotic theory that's been developed 
on this abstract space of lattices to answer all the questions we want, right? So that's basically the story. Um, and just as a side remark for, for, for those who are interested in these details, the space of lattices is a special case of a homogeneous space. And this homogeneous space is of the form, take a Lie group, modulo a discrete subgroup of this Lie group. So in our setting, the Lie group will be SLNR and the discrete subgroup will be SLNZ. And we use very powerful, uh, a very powerful machinery that's been developed by uh, uh, pioneers in this area, um, Dani, Margulis, and Ratner, who uh, have explained to us how equidistribution mixing properties on these homogeneous spaces can be established. And one of the most famous, and I would say one of the most famous or, or most important um, discoveries uh, in, in the second half of the of the last century in mathematics is Ratner's measure classification theorem that really answers all the questions around um, equidistribution of certain dynamical systems on these homogeneous spaces. So that's a side remark for the mathematicians. The take home message really for you is um, when we ask questions about uh, particles that move in, very, in an array of very small scatterers, we can turn the problem into a problem of a new dynamical system where rather than studying the original dynamics, we, we study dynamics on the environment that is now changing. Yeah, so the, the particle is now actually fixed. It's not moving anymore, but the environment is changing. And we use a renormalization re dynamics on the environment to prove the theorems we want to prove. And just to say, and I think that's also a cute observation, the, the limit distributions we've seen here, the free path length distribution appears also elsewhere in physics. So when you look at the level spacing distribution of a uh, harmonic oscillator, if you look at its quantum spectrum, so first year quantum mechanics, we know how this looks like. This is the spectrum of a two dimensional harmonic oscillator. And you look at the distribution of gaps between the energy levels. Um, you find that there is a distribution if you assume that the frequencies are random. So that's something we need to we need to assume. So I look at a harmonic oscillator with random frequencies, and I've plotted here to you a histogram, a numerical computation, and compared it with the with the free path length distribution that we found for the Lorentz gas, and it's the same distribution as you can see. And actually, one can prove this with the same techniques that I've explained to you um, before. Um, I have a little nice article about this in the in the newsletter of the London Mathematical Society, which is again for a general audience so if you want to learn more about this i recommend this and here are just the two distributions side by side so you can see they are not the same on the um, for the actual systems they only become the same when you when you go into the appropriate limits and you see those two limit distributions side by side here okay very good so i will probably stop in in about two minutes or so all I wanted to now make the connection as promised in my title to quantum kinetics. So far, I've only talked about classical kinetics. Yes, uh, 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 particles that are subject to classical uh, laws of motion. But of course, we live in a quantum world. And you can ask the same questions here. If you have a quantum mechanical uh, uh, electron cloud moving in, in, um, in, in matter, is there any difference between a periodic setting and a disordered setting? And of course, the uh, absolutely critical pioneering ob observation was due to um, Phil Anderson, uh, Nobel Prize 1977, for precisely this observation, is that unlike the periodic setting where we have a well-developed theory, that's again the first thing you learn in solid state physics, is that you can describe a motion of electrons through a perfect crystal um, through Bloch theory. 
um, which essentially explains that the waves in the respective uh, energy bands propagate through your crystal uh, almost unperturbed, um, that so-called ballistic transport. But if you introduce random impurities in your crystal, those random impurities have the dramatic effect that uh, eigenfunctions become localized and therefore you don't have any more this unhindered um, uh, uh, transport, no more ballistic transport. But even more surprising, perhaps, you don't even have diffusion as in the classical setting. You don't get Brownian motion. You just uh, have a suppression of this diffusion. And what I've been interested in is what happens in this scenario when you don't look at a fixed potential, but you again go into this boltzmann grad limit where the radius of your potential is very, very small. Um, and uh, what, what are the phenomena there? So you now have an initial quantum wave packet with a certain wavelength that I call H here, related to H bar, if you want. Um, and your scatterers um, are on a certain length scale and they're very, very small. And this has been something that's been studied uh, as well for a long time. Um, uh, with some really crucial results in, in the uh, late 1990s by Erdős and Yao, um, who showed that actually you no longer have Anderson localization, but you do get back to uh, a diffusive process. And the reason here simply is that you now have a very interesting interaction between the uh, potentials where you have quantum scattering and because the potentials are very far apart now, free uh, a quantum propagation in between. So no more Anderson localization, but you're back to, um, to uh, the linear Boltzmann equation in this setting. And, you know, but what happens in the periodic setting? So most of you who are solid state physicists say, well, we understand everything about periodic potentials. And I just want to challenge this because we understand everything about periodic potentials when they are fixed. But when they become very, very localized and uh, uh, spaced, so exactly as in the boltzmann grad limit, um, in fact, the bands shrink and become very dense. So you lose the effect of the, of the band structures. Um, and, uh, you know, with my, with my uh, former student, Jory Griffin, we've developed a, a heuristics that shows that you actually also see a new process uh, emerge for periodic potentials. Um, that's very different from the linear Boltzmann equation, but that's also very different from the kind of formulas we know from classic solid state physics. And I don't wanna go into details. Anyone who's interested, I would love to hear some feedback on, on you. We have a recent paper in Journal of Statistical Physics and um, uh, where we describe our limiting process. And you see here, the formulas are, I think, too, too involved to, um, to be presented on a, on, on a general colloquium like that, but they're quite pretty. Um, they involve Bessel functions and so on. Um, and, um, uh, but we, I have to admit, we have so far not understood anything beyond those nice explicit formulas in terms of the long time dynamics um, uh, and uh, whether this will lead to ballistic or diffusive transport. So that's where I wanna stop. And I just want to, conclude by giving you a, a little summary of the, um, the, the highlights here. I mean, first of all, I hope I, I've been able to convince you that the butterfly effect is not just something where you see, well, that's clearly is nonsense, but it actually can be used in a very effective way to prove statistical descriptions of chaotic systems. And furthermore, it allows us to derive macroscopic transport models from the underlying um, uh, macroscopic fundamental laws of motions. And as uh, a side product, you don't only get to derive equations that have been in the literature for a long time, just without the understanding if they're compatible with the microscopic laws, but we see new limit distributions observed that haven't uh, been, uh, 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 that weren't known before. So that's what I find is the most exciting aspect of all of this work. Um, 
And then finally, you know, there is no analog of the butterfly effect in quantum mechanics because there are no real trajectories. So you don't have this notion of sensitivity on, on initial conditions. But as you've seen in this work of Erdős and Yao, you still see the linear Boltzmann equation emerge, and you you do have you do have other um, uh, aspects of of um, statistical properties that in quantum mechanics are good substitutes for the butterfly effect. Um, but that maybe is, is even something for, for another lecture on, on quantum chaos and so on, where people have thought for a very long time is, you know, wh what is the analog of a butterfly effect in quantum mechanics? So let me just stop here. Um, so thank you very much for, for sticking with me and, and for, 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 for listening. Um, I hope you have some questions for me. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mark Roth. So thank you for this very uh, interesting, very enlightening talk. Uh, I have enjoyed a lot. I think all the audience have uh, enjoyed a lot. Uh, you introduced some very deep concepts using very insightful and uh, very uh, simple pictures. So now I would like to invite a question from the audience. Yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please speak up. Okay, so uh, I have uh, two questions here. So my question is, uh, is it possible uh, to physically test the limiting distribution of uh, these micro microscopic quantities like uh, the distri limiting distribution of the free paths? And my second question is, uh, is the limiting distribution sensitive to the shape of your scatters? For, for instance, uh, uh, if you change your scatters from balls to squares, I am aware that some dynamicists are working on these models, but maybe yeah. I don't know what, uh, yeah. So, uh, and- uh, these, are, these are great questions. These are really great questions. So the first question, um, no, I don't know anyone who has ever seen these limit distributions in an experiment. Now there is a, um, uh, you, you have seen them uh, in numerical simulations. In fact, you know, physicists have made a lot of numerical simulations and saw these heavy tail distributions already earlier. There's a very good group in Mexico who make very precise um, uh, simulations. And the histograms that I showed you are, are from this group. What I would love to see, I don't know if there are any neutron scattering people in here, uh, uh, whether one can actually do see this. And neutron scattering would be, and, and, and again, I'm, I'm not sufficiently expert in this to see whether it is realistic, but if you, neutrons of course have very short range interactions. So the description of um, uh, the, the sort of very dilute limit with very small scatterers uh, would correspond to very, very short range interactions. So my dream would be that what can see at least this heavy tail distribution in the free path links and some neutron scattering experiment in a perfect crystal. Now, the problem is, of course, that your crystal needs to be perfect. <laughs> and so you need to have a very low temperature to make sure that the oscillations in your crystal are uh, uh, of the same order as the as as the interaction length, the scattering length itself, because otherwise, as soon as you start perturbing that too much, we can actually show that you see the linear Boltzmann equation come back. So even if it's not completely disordered, but you just start with a crystal and you start moving them around a little bit, you will see the linear Boltzmann equation. So. Uh, but that would be a dream. I don't know if any any uh, uh, experts on on neutron scattering are in here, or maybe some other scattering experiments. I don't know. But the short short range potential is absolutely critical. If you so, our theory works for very general potentials. But an important aspect is always that it's a convex scatterer, which exactly generates the sensitivity dependence on initial conditions. If you replace your spheres by a square. Uh, so if your scatterers look like this, um, then you lose this in uh, dependence, the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So if I uh, sort of have a little angle here, uh, 
you remember my picture with a sphere, here the outgoing angle will not double after the reflection. It increases by the same amount. So your error doesn't increase exponentially, but just linearly. And the consequence of this is that you can still prove the kind of things that that we prove here in this boltzmann grad limit, but you get completely different answers and you get a very, very slow decay of correlations. And it's in fact a big area um, also in dynamical systems to look at such, uh, such objects. And there's a beautiful theory around it, but you will not be able to derive sort of macroscopic transport laws um, that, um, that we've seen here. So thanks for your question. Thank you for the explanation. Uh, any other questions? There is one in the chat I just see. Oh, okay. So, uh, can you see, uh... Uh, please show the slide showing the formula connecting probability and big O. Is this the one in the very beginning? Was this with the, the, the doubling map and the coin tossing? George Pang asked me this. It was just a direct message. Was it this slide? Yeah, could you unmute yourself just to speak up? Let me see this slide. Maybe you just wanted to see the slide. That's okay. <laughs> Great. Okay. I think I've answered that question. Okay. Uh, so, so James, I have a uh, naive question. Uh, so when you show the distribution of the uh, mean free pass distribution, yes. uh, there's a yes. diagram, there's a plot uh, for the crystal. Yeah. yeah. So there's a plateau, right? Uh, at the, when T is small. Yes. Where is it? Here, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's that one exactly. Yeah, so that plateau does it correspond to uh, the lattice constant? The time, um, yeah, yeah. So, so the lattice constant, the lattice is normalized to have lattice constant one here. Mm -hmm. Um, the the pi over six here in front corresponds to the density of primitive lattice points because you you don't see lattice points that are hidden behind another lattice point. So that's a very special feature on a crystal. If you're in a disordered medium, you actually see all the points around you as they become smaller and smaller and smaller. But in, a, in the crystal, no matter how small you make your scatterers, the ones that are on the same line, let me see, where have I got a crystal? Yeah, if you look at these, right? If you start from somewhere here, and then you draw a line uh, in some rational direction, you see that some points will be hidden behind others. And so you call the visible lattice points or primitive lattice points, the ones that you see, they have a direct line of sight and their, their density uh, is six over pi squared. And that's where this comes up. Um, the, and the fact that you have a constant here follows exactly from, uh, remember, this is now a probability density. Um, uh, and the, the fact that it's at one is not related, well, it, it sometimes is related, but it's not obviously related to the fact that your scatterers are distance one apart. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a complicated, it's a kind of complicated calculation to, to arrive this, at this formula. It looks like a simple formula, but to get there is not so, it's not so trivial. Okay, thank you, thank you. So any, any other questions from the audience? Hello, Professor. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think uh, in experiment, uh, in experiment of uh, quantum mechanics, uh, the yeah. the quantum states uh, have only a limited uh, fidelity. 
uh, there is yes. always some uh, noises and errors in the quantum states. So I, I want to know that uh, uh, whether uh, the, the noises and the random arrows uh, can play a role like the butterfly effect uh, you described just uh, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's a, a lot of work that has been done on fidelity and quantum chaos, where you look at the time evolution of your original system and a perturbed system. You actually now don't perturb the trajectory, but you perturb your system. And you look at correlations functions between your original and your perturbed system. And, and you can use this to characterize uh, uh, the difference between starting with a system that's integrable, non-chaotic, if you like, and, and you perturb it, you see different evolution from when you start with a quantum chaotic system and its perturbation. Um, the the basis, basic sort of discovery here is that in if you have a sort of quantum chaotic system, its energy spectrum can be modeled by random matrix theory. Um, so your Hamiltonian in a quantum chaotic system behaves as if, uh, as if it were a random matrix. Um, and using this as an assumption can make a lot of interesting predictions also about the fidelity um, of quantum chaotic systems using random matrix theory. Okay, so is there some measures for us to uh to reduce the randomness or correct as a, a final result? Um, so I, I can't answer that question because these are all very subtle phenomena and uh, you need to, you know, if you ask precise questions, uh, I think you, there, there are, you know, using random matrix tree, you can, you can model the answers. But I can't answer your question like that um, uh, because it's it's even for the for the not sort of for the the integrable quantum systems you still see a lot of randomness and and the, uh, the sort of the the outcome in terms of their time evolution is a much more subtle effect than than what we see here because oh, okay. they also behave randomly you know into even integrable quantum system have a lot of randomness built into it it's just that the quality of the randomness is different from um, um, those quantum chaotic systems where you see random matrix theory. In the, in the integrable case, the spectra are still random, but they're more modeled by independent random variables. So the eigenvalues of an integrable quantum system typically behave um, like independent random variables from a Poisson point process, whereas in the quantum chaotic setting, they behave like random matrix theory. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, any other questions? So James, I have another question. Uh, so so, okay. so, so you, so far you uh, talk up, you know, uh, you consider only uh, the scatterers are like a, have a spherical shape, right? Yes. So just in case, so uh, do people consider an isotropic shape, like uh, uh, if the scatterer have an elliptical shape, you know, along certain orientation? Yes. So what would that affect the, of course, you know, it will introduce isotropic scattering process, right? So, yes, uh, yes. so what other interesting phenomena might arise from there, you know, by introducing this anisotropy? No, absolutely. This is again, a very interesting question, um, uh, which we, our model and the, and the quantum model, we, we, we have not had this assumption of spherical symmetry, but we did have this assumption in our, in our classical work. And um, our theory can be extended to non-sphericly symmetric scatterers like ellipses, as you say. Um, and what will happen then is that when you think about the free path length distribution, it will now depend in which direction you're going because the, uh, the total scattering cross-section of your ellipse will look different depending which direction you're coming from. And however, the limiting process we can still describe, it just will be anisotropic in the sense of a rescaling of the, of the, of the cross section and the mean free path. Um, the, the sort of stochasticity of the process will still be the same. So we'll still see a Markov process that describes the limit 
um, but it will now be direction dependent, of course. So they, is it like a very simple sinusoidal dependence over the angle? Yes, you will, you will see a, a, a simple dependence. The process itself will be very similar. It just be a rescaling of the, the, the sort of mean free path lengths and the expectation values in those different directions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if there are no other questions, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Makhlov again uh, for this uh, very interesting and exciting talk. So Professor Makhlov, I hope you know in the future we can invite you back again to come to visit us in person. So yeah, can, I would be uh, delighted. Yeah, yeah, I would be delighted to come and visit you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.